everyone, welcome back to The Lila Joe Show and welcome to season three. I'm Lila. I'm an elite ice dancer and a psychology student. I'm also very curious about people and the fascinating stories that we all have to tell. So today, please welcome my guest to share their story. Today's conversation is with Tessa Virtue. For over 22 years, Tessa and her skating partner Scott Moyer proudly wore the Canadian flag on their backs while graciously collecting medal upon medal around their necks. They became the most decorated Olympic figure skaters of all time, winning gold in 2010, two silvers in 2014, and claiming gold twice more in 2018. Tessa and Scott have made history and have planted the ice dance dream in the hearts of young skaters all over the world, including mine when I was nine years old. Outside of the rink, Tessa received an honorary doctorate from the University of Western Ontario and studied psychology at the University of Windsor. Now she is doing her MBA at Queen's University, ready to step into her power suit and take her place as a groundbreaking businesswoman. Tessa Virtue is an extraordinary woman who has made and continues to make her mark on the world. She has such ambition and resilience, which is coupled so effortlessly with her elegance, grace, and gentle spirit. May I also add that she has a fantastic sense of humor. Tessa thrives when she is learning and seeks growth in all that she pursues. As Tessa steps assertively into this new chapter of her life, she does so with enthusiasm, deep, insightful thought, and her most powerful tool, a heart of gold. Tessa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. What a privilege. I'm so thrilled to see you firstly and to have this conversation with you. Um, So let's get straight into it. My interviews are structured like workouts, which I know you have a lot of experience with. So we start off with a warm up, then we move into a longer period of high intensity questioning, and then the cool down to wrap it all up. How does that sound? I love that. That's the most working out I've done in a while. Okay. (laughs) So let's get into it. We're going to start with some quick fire questions to get the blood pumping. What is the last thing that made you laugh? I tripped walking down the street yesterday and had a complete laugh attack. Okay. How did that happen? Oh, that's a normal occurrence for me. I'm so naturally clumsy and uncoordinated, especially when I'm off the ice. Oh, (laughs) interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Surprising as well. What is your favorite dessert? McCain's Deep and Delicious Chocolate Cake. Ooh, no hesitation there. I love it. What is your least favorite dance style? On the ice, I think maybe waltz or, um, yeah, I think, I think waltz. Sometimes I find, I don't know about you, when you're holding such a stiff position, and I'm not a great breather, so I found actually my upper body was always in a lot of pain. (laughs) And also kind of the feeling of standing up so straight and then that restricting the breathing even more in a way. Exactly, yes, just needing to be perfectly in place, and it's sort of like ducks on a water, you know, your legs are doing all the work, but your back is so stiff and structured, Yeah. so not my favorite. What is the most Canadian thing about you? I apologize a lot. Sorry. Yeah, and it often comes in three. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, three. Okay, so just really emphasizing that apology. <laughs> <Right>. yeah. <laughs> to the work of which artist or musician would you compare your skating style? Oh, that's so hard. I'm not actually sure that's a question I can answer because I view my skating so differently and from such a different lens. In fact, it's really hard for me to go back and watch video. I know we've spoken about that in the past, how Mm -hmm. um, a lot of artists might feel that. But uh, after the the Sochi Games and we came back to prepare for the Pyeongchang Olympics, I had David Bowie in my head a lot because he was the king of reinvention. And certainly not to put us on that level um, where he was as an artist, but more so just to feel like we had the freedom to explore and try new things Mm. and so I always talked about our comeback and in my head I wanted it to be this Dickie Stardust moment where I had blonde hair and we skated to our opening position (laughs) differently and everything about us you know someone might see us on the ice and say who is that team instead of oh that same old Scott and Tessa so 
David Bowie was one that really was top of mind as we mm. planned those last two years of our career. <laughs> so let's go with that. I love that. <laughs> what is your ideal date night, regardless of the current circumstances? It's changed because of the current circumstances. Okay. Now I would say staying in and cooking, um, maybe going for a walk or something really simple. Mm. Um I don't think it takes much, you know, a, a crib game after dinner, <laughs> a glass of wine, some good music, dancing at home. That's about oh, it. Oh, that sounds pretty perfect to me. <laughs> and I know that you love a cozy night in with PJs. So what do your favorite pair of pajamas look like? They are fuzzy and they have flamingos all over them. <laughs> okay. I think I need a pair. We need some matching ones for that our tea nights. Amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So are you warm? That's our warm-up done. I'm warm. Thank I like this strategy. <laughs> I just feel like we need to get into it, and we're That's such clever. pros at working I, out. Did you start interviewing with that sort of approach? Yeah. Right from the beginning? Yeah, That's I very wanted smart. to think of a structure that felt natural to me and also unique as, like, an athlete interviewer. So people like it so far, and I certainly enjoy the, the structure. So I'm sticking with it for now. That's great. So I always like to start with my guest childhood to understand your foundation and how you flourished into who you are today. And your best friend and number one confidant is your wonderful mother, Kate. And it seems like she planted the seed for what would be your mantra in the 2018 Games with Scott, which was, we are unstoppable. As a child, how did your mother reinforce in you the knowledge that you were limitless? My mom's approach to parenting was to equip me with the skill set to you know flee the nest and flourish so she wanted all of her kids to be fearless no matter what we might take on whether that was just walking up to uh, a table to eat lunch at high school or going skiing for the first time um, whatever it was, she wanted us to approach with this feeling like we had the confidence to try. Mm. And that gave me the sense of self-worth and it also gave me a sense of self. Like I was trusted to make decisions really early on and I failed and I fell <laughs> and I stumbled, but she allowed me the freedom to do that. Mm. And I think that's so important because I applied all of that then to sport, especially, you know, whatever it was I was taking on, I knew that it was coming from a place of deep internal motivation because I had chosen it and yeah. I needed to put in the work to, to succeed uh, at any different level. Mm. And I know that there's such power in a sense of autonomy, especially as a child to be able to feel like you have that choice and that you're really you're the driver of your own life that's really it's an admirable quality in a parent for sure it is and I can imagine it's not easy I totally understand parents who want to bubble wrap their children and protect them Me from too. you know all of the hardships and obstacles in the world that they might face but it does offer me a real sense of self-confidence in knowing that um, you know I have experience and you know that I have a certain toolkit uh, available to me should mm. should I need it. And speaking of this toolkit, because I know that your mom was a dancer growing up and you started ballet, which was your first love at three years old. And I know that you spent one particularly transformative month at nine years old at the National Ballet. So what tools did this month equip you with that you feel are prevalent and very much used today in your life? It ended up being, as you said, really a special formative month for me. The first two weeks, uh, you're not allowed any contact with your family. So no letters, no phone calls or anything mm. at, at nine years old. And nine. I think the whole point is to, to throw you curveballs and see how you adapt and cope. So things like, you know, learn how to just sew your the ribbons on your point shoes um, or budget for your snacks <laughs> or, um, you know, whatever workouts and then dealing with, you know, other dancers coming up and saying, I've already been accepted into the program and feeling deflated because I hadn't received that news yet. And, you know, things like that. So I think what that taught me was that I 
was resilient. And again, I just learned how to develop these coping mechanisms to thrive on my own and sort of the sense that I could get through anything. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, that month at the National Ballet was um, awful by any means because in, in, in fact it really was special, but it was difficult, it was hard. And, and that was the point, every, every moment of every day was a test. Mm. And I was sort of the perfect candidate because I'm a people pleaser and a perfectionist. So it's so sad to look through the journal from when I was nine staying there and, you know, I just lament about messing up the choreography or the steps or uh, my bun fell out in class uh, one day and I was so discouraged and I just felt like I had disappointed the teachers and I would do anything to make up for it. And so it was, it's interesting to reflect back on now just that um, notion of being compelled to please and mm. compelled to accommodate others was was really obvious even then mm. and as a young girl you said that you were always watching and observing and had quite the knack for imitating people so for example your gymnastics coach you wore the same track suit put your hair up with the same scrunchie and even went as far as to chew the same gum so when were you able to retire from the role of an observant understudy and begin to step in and celebrate your own quirks to then become somebody for others to imitate? What a great question and such a good memory you have. Mm. Uh, I think that sense of that imitation and, and that I did a lot when I was younger probably comes from being the youngest child and not always... Um, having people around my own age to play with so I would you know play through my imagination and create these scenes and and um very elaborate sort of setups in my head I think part of moving away when I was young at 13 and then maybe more so to Michigan at 15 mm -hmm. that was a bit of a transition I would say uh, being a teenager and, and trying to figure out where I really fit in and then ultimately maybe when I was 17 or so realizing that I would be on a path that was abnormal so I was forced to sort of reflect in those teenage years on you know who I was and as you know when I stance you can only imitate Shailen Bourne for so long <laughs> at some point <laughs> you have to make your own mark and Scott and I wanted to be quite definitive about having our own signature if not style then approach to skating and what was that at that time it was learning how to be powerful and aggressive and set ourselves apart with maybe some acrobatic lifts given that we were smaller and younger than every other team okay. so that it did evolve over the years our, our approach but it was always about maximizing every moment in training and doing whatever it took to be able to rise to an occasion and perform under pressure mm. I know that you started skating for the first time because there was a certain school trip planned so you asked your grandmother to take you to the rink so that you'd be prepared and ready to go for that trip and I know that at first she was quite adamant that skating remained something that you did for fun and wanted to shield you from the tests and the competitive part of the sport. But it was the competition that really drew you to the sport and was essentially what was missing in your life upon your first retirement in 2014. So how did your home environment foster a passion for competition? My parents are both quite competitive. Uh, and each of my siblings as well. I, I always joke that I was the least athletic one of the family, but even backyard baseball games were heated. You know, mm -hmm. everything mattered, and, and we all sort of approached, particularly sport, with that same enthusiasm and drive. Um, but I, I learned pretty early on that that competitive fire burned brightly inside me, and it propelled me in so many ways. Um, because it was a benchmark. It was always something to strive for. Mm -hmm. And I'm such a goal-oriented, task-oriented person that when I know what I'm working towards, it's quite clear for me, which has been an interesting thing to navigate, especially recently, and just figuring out where I channel that energy Yeah, now. yeah. And you said that you were surrounded by compassionate, 
considerate and empathetic people growing up. And for me, this is such a radiant quality in your character. How have you been able to use the superpowers of empathy and compassion in a competitive environment when head to head with your greatest rivals, especially in a sport where women are so often pitted against one another? Yeah, it's an unfortunate part of not just figure skating's culture, but our society at large. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad that, you know, we grow up with that exact notion that you mentioned, we're pitted against one another as females, especially when we can compare that with our male counterparts who simply don't face that in the same way. Empathy comes into play when you realize that that rivalry or that heated sense of competition is actually so healthy. Um, When you can turn that into a positive, reframe it and realize that that's what makes everyone better. If we Mm -hmm. elevate the entire field, then everyone is at their best and, and that's true competition and that's what you want. So Scott was so good at always pointing that out to me, um, saying, you know, whether he was comparing it to basketball (laughs) or hockey or whatever it was, that sport thrives with rivals and intense competition, and and we can all benefit from that. Mm -hmm. But each competitor has their own moment. I mean, there's no momentum, there's no back and forth um, between teams in a competitive setting. So each skater has their own moments of three or four minutes on the ice and you get to define that and you get Mm. to create the feeling you want that is totally up to you and it's really you against the scoring system then so i think being compassionate for the nerves and the pressure that other skaters are are facing and feeling and realizing we're we're sort of all in this together exactly um especially on a day-to-day basis in training i mean you know that better than anyone and then also um, empathy with a partner when you're spending that much time together and you're relying on one another um, solely to accomplish a goal you you have to be empathetic about their process and who they are and how they approach things and so much of the partnership comes down to being able to put yourself in another's shoes Mm -hmm. it's true and so the next part of the story involves a certain guy called scott moyer (laughs) And you met when you were around six years old and he was eight. And as such an observant young girl, what fascinated you the most about Scott? His ability to hold a crowd. I mean, he was always the center of attention. (laughs) He was always the fun goofball, but he had this knack for charming people, um, young and old. And that kind of captivating personality is clear even today. He is energetic, passionate, um, spunky. And at that time, I remember thinking he was seemingly unafraid of what people thought of him. Hmm. How did that influence your need to please people and potentially worry of what others were thinking about you? As, as it related to our partnership, I think we set some patterns very early on um, in that it's my nature to accommodate. And so whether that was the energy, the mood, the feeling on the ice, that was really dictated by Scott. And it was my job and my role in the partnership to adapt and be the equilibrium, if you will, um, and sort of offer what he needed at certain moments. And I didn't realize that until much, much later in our career. And and that continued, but I think ultimately in a healthier way for both of us. Um, but there was such balance there because we offered such different qualities. I mean, we came at it from opposite ends of the spectrum personality-wise. Mm-hmm. and. It took some time, but we were able to create a really special place on the ice where we felt completely safe and free and supported. Mm, that's beautiful. And of course, after skating together for 22 years, I'd say you know him pretty well. And I have a segment on my show where I have my guest create the Instagram bio for their skating partner. What are some key details that you absolutely must include in Scott's bio that a lot of people might not know about him? He is 
generous, incredibly generous in, in every way possible. He's determined. He's one of the most driven athletes I've ever seen. And, you know, fortunately for me, I was able to feed off of that energy every day. But he taught me what it meant to really be an athlete. I mean, one of our coaches, Paul McIntosh, said that he, he's a training animal. And in that setting, he was at his best. Um, you know, he could focus his energy and attention into something that really mattered and meant something to him. He is fun and funny, and I, he takes his role uh, as a family member, as a community member, even his role within the skating community very seriously. Hmm. Yeah, I know that he's definitely a family man. Yes. And you've spoken about having a very strong head energy while Scott leads very much with his heart. How have you been able to quieten down your dominant thoughts and rather listen to the whispers of your heart and gut? It was always important for me, especially as I moved ahead in my career, to approach it like a business. And it meant that that might not be my space to make friends. It might not be the place that filled um, the void of my personal life. It, it wasn't in skating, but it allowed me to approach things very logically, methodically, and it really took the emotion out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Just the way that at the start of each season, we would seek new resources um, for new programs and, and new elements of our training. It all was strategic and I think that was necessary for me, and I don't know if that's being a female in the sport or if that was just simply, you know, the way that I decided to cope with that. Um, but as you say, Scott was the opposite. So the challenge was when I was on the ice, especially, how could I let myself give in and be free in a moment? And Marie France taught me that um, maybe more than anyone. You know, when the music starts, you get to to dive in and and be another character for four minutes and just be in that bubble, that world, mm -hmm. that sphere. And how rare is that for most people in life to, yeah. to have that sort of escape or outlet creatively? So I, I did feel like within the business construct that I had created, you know, in, in my approach to sport, it was really when our music played that I could try and let my heart lead. Oh. And so much of that was easy because I could play off of Scott's very tactile energy that was so much from the heart. I mean, that's, that's all he, that guides him, really. It's a gut and it's heart. Mm -hmm. And it was fun to be able to just be that close to him, to, just to almost allow myself to be free mm -hmm. and liberated. You know, that's so refreshing to hear because, as you know, I'm very much a head energy as well. And I like to satisfy my intellect. And I think too much in skating, it's true. But it's nice to be able to hear that you could channel it and really entertain that, that part of who you are and that dominant trait. But then that was more in terms of the planning and the decision making. But then there's still that moment of release afterwards. It's a really cool insight. Yeah, and I think, I mean... The cool thing about our sport is that you can also plan that as you're learning something or working on something with different coaches. Often with Patch, for example, we would decide at the beginning of the lesson, this is going to be very technical. And we were writing notes and we were really analytical about our edges and our um, body leans and, and the way that our blades were running on the ice. Like That was very, very technical, but, but I knew that. And so, you know, all of my energy for that hour was spent technically and we would decide at the beginning of the next hour that this was just a feeling you know feeling our feeling run through it was just um for us to feel connected to our characters and each other and i think that's the beauty of figure skating i was always so fortunate to be able to oscillate between the two yeah it's rare it's rare to have that opportunity in one's job mm -hmm. So you and Scott had quite the whirlwind romance at ages 8 and 10. You dated for 8 months and had a total of 2 phone conversations. So you guys were pretty out of control back then. <laughs> and the romance that we see on the ice, it's led fans to really yearn for you to be together off of the ice. And you've claimed that the relationship was only ever platonic. 
But people don't want to believe this because the sensual energy between the two of you is simply undeniable. So let's clear up the rumors. Mm -hmm. Other than the eight months mentioned before, in the entire 22 years of skating together, was there ever a time when you entertained a romance or flirted with the possibility of what if? No, we never we never allowed ourselves to go there. Um, I think because we respected the partnership so much, first and foremost, but also because we always wanted to give one another space off of the ice. So we spent so much time together, 50 weeks of the year, that even when we left the rink, so our quote unquote office hours, we would not often follow up with a phone call, a text, an email, unless it was, you know, a, a business decision. We really had our own lives and identities outside of skating. And skating was common ground for us. It's what brought us together. And we loved spending time together. And we, we genuinely enjoyed working together. But I wonder if maybe that part of that chemistry that is seen is because we we weren't a couple <laughs> off of the ice. You know, sometimes yeah. there's more tension that way. Um, and I think there's also just a really deep-rooted level of respect and care and love that, you know, is obvious because it's so sincere. Like, mm. a lot of that comes from a very authentic place. And, and then it's easy to layer on the nuance and the character and the expression when a really solid foundation of love and adoration has been fostered. How do you see that foundation having changed if you had entertained a romance together? I don't know. I mean, it just happened to work for us that the balance of being able to get away from skating when we both left the rink was healthy for us mm -hmm. and and that's how we managed and then it was still so fun to show up the next day and, and see each other and and work and I'm not saying it was always easy but there was a, a real thrill in the excitement of pursuing a common goal yeah and I think that just meant so much to us that it superseded everything else yeah I understand that yeah and one of the most significant obstacles that you had to face throughout your career was the excruciating pain in your shins from chronic exertional compartment syndrome, which led to not one but two surgeries, the first of which coincided with what you said was the worst time in your relationship with Scott. Because after spending at least eight hours a day together for what was 12 years before, you didn't talk for two and a half months. So along with having to relearn to walk, to skate, your choreography, you also had to relearn your relationship with Scott. So what was the biggest barrier that you had to break through in order to get back to the depth of connection that you'd previously harbored? A big part of that was learning how to start the difficult conversations. Hmm. And we're both sensitive, we're both stubborn, um, we're both probably too conscious of hurting the other's feelings. And that, in a lot of ways, was what bolstered, you know, such a, such a unique bond in, in what we shared. But it, it might have been, um, might have worked against us sometimes when we just needed some brutal honesty mm -hmm. um, because we would tiptoe around things and, and sort of walk on eggshells just for fear of hurting the other. But... It was beginning those conversations. It was committing to basically marriage counseling and yeah. therapy um, and learning that how we communicated, how we spoke to one another was just as important as how we pushed on the ice or how we skated in multiple position. Mm. Um, it was fundamental and critical to our success that at the root of it all and at the center of it all was a really strong, streamlined sense of communication. Mm -hmm. Now, so now I wanna understand the extremity of what retirement would look like because you had an extra decade of experiences that would strengthen that bond even further. So did you experience a grieving process after your final goodbye to Scott Moyer as your skating partner? Yes, yeah, I did. I. I remember feeling like 
maybe I was losing my best friend and, and that sort of constant source of stability and support, which is crazy because I mean, we talked about that too. He'll always be in my life and he'll always be there for me. Yeah. And I know that, but without having skating to really bring us together and without feeling like we were working towards the same thing, I worried that, you know, some of that would dissipate mm -hmm. and our personal lives would take over and, you know, maybe we wouldn't come together in the same way. And yeah, I did. I felt like, I mean, I lost a business partner and I lost a best friend and I lost a skating partner. And, um, so all of that was going through my mind sort of as we finished our tour. And then I realized like, actually how beautiful that was to be able to end that chapter in exactly the way that we envisioned, mm. um, leave on our own terms, just like we did in competition and then begin a new friendship where we had put in all the work we had, you know, gone through all the hardships together. Now we just get to enjoy each other's company, you know, without the pressure or anxiety, um, or stress that comes with, you know, having interconnecting, business lives yeah. and so it's it's kind of a fun stage to be at especially as we both pursue our own projects I think oh I'm so lucky to have that friend in my life um you know forever and all time uh, especially given our history I mean that no one will take that away from us and mm -hmm. I think I just had to realize that in time so what role does Scott play in your life today he plays the role of really really good friend mm -hmm. and I mean we have so many shared experiences that will bond us in a way that no one else will ever understand even those closest to us mm -hmm. um but it's so nice to be able to to know that should either of us ever pick up the phone and need something the other would be there in a heartbeat you're listening to The Lila Joe Show. So this injury continued to haunt you all the way to the ice at your Olympic debut in Vancouver in 2010. And I don't think people fully understand the extent to which you suffered at this time to the point where even the three minute walk to the cafeteria in the Olympic Village was barely enough for you to handle once a day. And timing is such a crucial part in the sport and this was your golden opportunity, literally. So how did you weigh the risks and reward of training relentlessly and competing to become Olympic champions while quite possibly pushing the injury to the point that you would ruin your future in the sport. It's so interesting to look back on all of it because I think as more time passes, I see it through a different lens. Okay. And recently my legs have acted up again and I felt immense pain. And that caused its own little flurry of emotion only because I thought upon retirement then maybe I wouldn't have to deal with that yeah. chronic pain which was silly of me and foolhardy to even think but I look back at the Vancouver games especially as I can so easily channel that pain and I know what, what I was feeling and I think that maybe to come full circle what my mom instilled in me when I was young that sense of resilience and autonomy and grit I was able to rely on because I needed to trust the training that we had and it might have been limited and it might not have been perfect but it it was all we had to go off of mm. and I needed to trust our material and I needed to trust my partner and I needed to ultimately just trust myself and trust that I had this the willpower to just push through and I did always feel that I always felt like no matter what happened I, I would just push through mm. the pain um, if required. So it was a strange feeling, but that was the first time we got into flow on the ice oh. in both. I'm not sure so much the compulsory dance, although we skated well, the original dance and the free dance at the time, we felt such flow. We were so present. I was aware of what was happening every single moment, but it was almost slow motion and I felt mm. in control and I felt this <laughs> probably unearned sense of like, we're just going to do it. We're just going to win. And I think that's oh. naivete and it's a bit of innocence, but I just knew it. I just felt like it was our rank. It was our time. And 
no one could stop us. Wow, what a feeling. Although I, I think Scott sounds... Scott tells me that I romanticized that a little bit. <laughs> I think you're allowed to. Go with okay. it. It's a, it's but a nice I did feel like strangely account. calm and serene as, as we took the ice, especially for the free dance site. Oh, my gosh. Um, of course I was nervous. Of course I was feeling the butterflies and, and the anxiety, but I did feel strangely calm. Mm. And I think that was just because I had no other choice but to mentally convince myself of those things, mm. whether they were true or not. <laughs> oh, interesting. So you mentioned that you just had to put your head down and suffer through the pain. Can you recount another experience in your life where you had to don this armor of grit and bear such pain, either physically or emotionally, because there was an opportunity to be seized? Yeah, I felt, I felt that a lot with my shins and calves, just with that particular injury. Yeah. But often there were times, like, for example, when my grandmother died or when I was really getting bullied at the rink or whatever it would have been, where I took that energy and it was probably our best training days or our best um, times of competition. And I think that's true for a lot of athletes that sometimes when you're a little bit sick, a little bit injured, something's going awry in your personal life, you're more focused uh, on what you need to do and you would never wish that on anyone, but it could just be the mindset of just needing to reframe and, and use that to your advantage also. It's a mental thing, but mm. that certainly came in handy. And I think you know, often when things were turbulent for us, we found a way to have our best performances. So if you don't mind talking about it, when your grandmother passed away, how did you shift such grief? Because I know that she she was such an important person in your life. How do you shift that into excellence on the ice? I felt like when I was on the ice, my job was clear and I knew what I needed to do. When I was in the gym, I knew what I needed to do. Sometimes at home or off the ice, like there's, you flounder without the same sense of purpose or structure. Mm -hmm. And while grief would overtake me, you know, in those situations, I would get on the ice and Scott would squeeze my hand and he'd say, oh, you're so much like Noni or something. Yeah. And it became an outlet. It just became an outlet. And she was there with you at the start, too. Yeah, exactly. Wow. I really see your injury as a metaphor, in a sense, for mental health and well-being. And I also believe in the power of acknowledging the cracks in the armor and honoring when you do feel down. So how have you learned to listen to yourself when it's time to sit with your feelings in order to work through the pain, rather than just pushing them aside? That's a fabulous question, Lila. I think I found I found my voice at some point because we're taught as athletes to push through the pain and we're, we're taught to just drive ourselves into a wall and we're taught to suck it up and yeah. not complain and be tough and grin and bear it um, and quite literally in figure skating we have to make it look easy, effortless smooth no matter what is happening so you know we're that's ingrained in us from such an early age as athletes and as performers but especially with the injury I had to find my voice because I had to learn that when I showed up at the rink and I said to Scott or to the coaches I'm in pain that it didn't make me a weak athlete it just made it easier for all of us to create an adapted like training schedule and plan mm -hmm. so it didn't make me less than and that's what I was so worried about for such a long time being a disappointment or letting Scott down and I, I think when I found my voice and I and I started communicating more efficiently about it and articulating the pain, then it made it less of a taboo subject also. Like it just made it like, okay, we can put anything on the table and deal with it. Hmm. Um, because we just know that we'll make it work. And, and I think that was a, a really powerful thing. And as far as reflecting, I've always been quite self-aware in the sense of I, I do analyze my feelings and emotions a lot just naturally. And then that's you know also been um, further established with my psychology studies yeah. and work with therapists. So it's, it's natural for me to do that. I need a sounding board. Sometimes I need to hear myself say things out loud to know the patterns or what's happening in my head. Who's and your sounding healthy. board? Uh, my mom usually. Yeah. 
she's the best sounding board. Sometimes your mom. Oh yeah, <laughs> she's too. a good sounding board, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've learned that that's healthy for me, and and when you zoom out and and realize that it's always a wave of emotion, the ups and downs, and mm. um, I think it's easier to embrace the low moments as much as you do the high moments. Yeah, and it's hard to not cling on to the high moments too because those those disappear just as quickly. Absolutely, and in fact, I think it's hard to cling on to them. It's hard to find joy in any kind of victory or happy moment because you're always looking ahead. Yeah. And you're always wanting to improve. And sure, just to use it in skating terms, you're standing on a podium, but in your mind you're thinking what you can do better for next time and how you'll handle things when you get home and you're back on the ice. And yeah. I think that's true of most things in life. You know, we're always planning so far in the future and trying to be bigger and better that we forget to take time to actually celebrate those little wins or moments along the way. Mm. Yeah, it's true. And I can tell that you get quite a lot of comfort and clarity in writing in journals. And they've certainly documented your dreams, emotions, and deep reflections over the years. So let's start with your first form of a journal, which was your grade one notebook, where you express for the first time your Olympic dream of competing with a Moyer boy, but it was actually Scott's older brother, Danny. So while you certainly manifested not one, but three Olympic appearances with a Moyer man. It was Scott, but I'm sure you're perfectly happy that it was him. <laughs> but you shared your incredibly honest and insightful journal entry from February 13th in 2010, just six days before the event started in Vancouver. And you wrote, somehow I don't feel I measure up. Do I belong here? I have to tell myself that I do. I deserve to be here. And then you realize that it's not just about being here, it's about winning. So how did you convince yourself to deny the thoughts and feelings of inadequacy and to then proceed with the mindset that the gold was yours to claim and then go on to do just that? Part of that was Marnie McBean, who's an Olympic rower, and she was a mentor for us. I remember seeing her in the village, and she said to us so plainly, someone is going to go out and win on the 22nd, I think it was. Someone is going to get the gold medal. Doesn't matter the ice conditions, it doesn't matter who's sitting in the stands, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world, someone is going to win the gold medal. So why not you? And that changed everything for me, because I thought, yeah, why not? <laughs> and mm. it's so easy for me to reflect on all the things and all the ways I'm not perfect, but whatever I'm working with, why can't that be enough? Wow. And there was a, um, forget who it was, it might have been Alex Bilodeau at the time, and he walked past us and Marnie said, does he look any different? And he had just won his Olympic medal. Oh and it's not really, like he was walking normally, getting his plate at the cap, and she said, does he look superhuman? Or, you know, like he, he is gifted with extraordinary talents, and he put in the work to prepare for that, but he's no different, you know? like. He, he just seemed so normal in that particular moment. Um, so there were moments like that. Marnie really was a big influence on us and instilling that confidence. Wow. And Scott was always such a great source of that. Like he really, where we would watch other teams and I would think of all the ways that they were better than us, he would flip that. And I'm not sure if that was just for my benefit or what he really saw, but he would flip mm. that and see all of the strengths and advantages that we might have. How do you see your... Olympic performance being different if Marnie had not given you that perspective? I think we might have been tentative and the programs we had in particular the original dance like we, we needed to just be aggressive and attack it at the risk of you know a misstep uh, and so maybe we would have been hesitant and it's so easy to do and then especially for the free dance when you're going in with the lead it's easy to skate safe yeah. and to play it safe and we talked a lot about, did it matter? We, especially in the 2018 games, um, and I'm sure we'll get there, sorry to jump there, but this whole notion of like, what changes? If, if we go in knowing that we have a lead no matter what, or if we go in knowing we're 20 points behind, what changes about our skate? How do we approach it differently? And ultimately we decided it doesn't change anything because mm -hmm. it's our moment, it's our program. 
we know how we want to perform it. So we couldn't let those outside factors influence us to such a great degree. Wow, that's very powerful because why does, yeah, why does being 20 points back or being in the lead change the job that you have to do? You still have to go out and do it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So much to reflect on. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking for the rest of the week. My goodness. Me too. I just, the problem is I want to ask all of these questions back to you. So I might need to guest host one week where that sounds I can put you on the spot. Okay. Yeah, I'm down. Let's okay, do that. Great. Okay. So your next Olympic appearance was in 2014 in Sochi. And people hesitate to bring this up because they view it as a touchy subject of contention. And this, of course, refers to the claims that the judging was potentially rigged um, and that the result that Merrill Davis and Charlie White winning was predetermined, thus leaving you with silver. What about your personal experience in Sochi contradicted onlookers assumptions, leading it to be what you said was the best month of your life? It really was such a special month. A big part of that was the team itself, Team Canada. We were so close having gone a lot of the athletes were in Vancouver as well and we had felt we had sort of grown up and gone through the ranks with our, our teammates part of being so removed and so cheap like we everyone really needed to come together even friends and family members that were there the sense of really being united was ever present and the venues were all quite close in, in proximity, so it made it easy to watch other events happen and you realize, okay, it's not just about ice dance here. There's so much more happening. We're part of something greater and mm -hmm. bigger. And just with the way things unfolded leading in, I mean, we sort of knew the cards were stacked against us and we've said that, but it truly felt like more than any other point in our career that it was us against the world. It was just the two of us. Mm -hmm. We were all we had to rely on. And that maybe feeling isolated served its own purpose because we were content with our performances. And um, looking back, we might not have loved our programs <laughs> or especially the free dance, but it was the best we could do in that moment. And we delivered. So when we walked away, we were fairly content. And also we do have the ability to watch Marilyn and Charlie, for example, and they, they, skated so well and probably outskated us, especially in the free dance. So there was no sense of bitterness or resentment for that. I think that's true competition. And in fact, that's the beauty of sport. Yes. So we were disappointed in silver, but we couldn't take anything away from our competitors. And, and we, we just weren't good enough. Like we just weren't good enough for them not to be doubted in the judges' minds. And that's on us. And so I think we took full responsibility. And of course, with time, it's easier to see that. Yeah. But it was such a special feeling, especially coming home and feeling like maybe we had let the country down and being welcomed with open arms and such a gracious sense of support and love and an outpouring of that from the country where we realized, oh, I wish we didn't go in thinking we needed to defend our title. I wish we went in just knowing that everyone wanted us to enjoy the skates and to and to be our best, the best that we could be. Mm. Um, I think maybe we just carried that weight with us onto the ice instead of shedding that mm. before stepping on. So it really seems like it was the community of Canada that really helped elevate you when you fell down after that experience. Totally. And we always take things pretty personally. Like any time there's an air or we don't skate well, we just look back at our preparation and assume that we weren't ready enough or our material, maybe it wasn't good enough up to the, the standard and the quality that it should have been. And so we're quick to, to look inward and, and think about all the ways that we could be better. Okay. And after the silver medal was placed around your neck, Scott snuck back onto the ice in Sochi to kiss the Olympic rings goodbye, or so he thought. <laughs> because little did he know that Two years later, he would be on a car ride with you to the Great Wall of China, randomly enough, where a firm decision would be made that you'd be returning to competition. So firstly, why this car ride? What prompted that conversation? We had flown to Beijing, I think it was only for 24 hours or something. We went right from the airport to the arena and did a dress rehearsal, then did a show the next day and we were flying home. So. 
it might have been fueled by jet lag. Okay. <laughs> and the best. Then the sense that we had just two hours to spare in the car. And that translator that was in the front seat would have, should write a book probably about those conversations. But um, <laughs> we just got talking about what would it look like? Who mm. would coach us? What music we would skate to? What style we would want to do? How we would try and off the ice differently? How we would manage my injury differently? All of those things that we just, again, thought we could be better. We, we still felt there was potential. And suddenly, at the end of that conversation, it, it wasn't a question anymore. We had just talked ourselves into it because we couldn't not try. I'm sure that there were many mental monsters to tame when taking the ice again for your return, but it seems like you actually had two simulations beforehand coming back from both surgeries. So how did these previous quote-unquote comebacks equip you for the most anticipated one of your career, which I assume was ridden with doubt and the inevitable fear? Oh, we were terrified. We were terrified because everyone sort of counted us out before we even came back. Everyone thought it was a bad decision for the most part across the board. Um, And whether that was, you know, just getting shut down from receiving funding to family and friends to the skating community just questioning the intentions of the comeback, um, we were terrified. And stepping onto the ice, it was in Montreal. It was also so weird for us because having only done shows for the for two years previously, there were no lights. It seemed so bright and I felt <laughs> so exposed, so vulnerable. I just wanted the dark, dark crowd and spotlights and the tunnel where I could hide behind. And um, So it was, it was terrifying and I remember so we started working with B210, um, an organization that helped facilitate our, our office needs and our service staff structure. Mm-hmm. And a few of those members were, were in the audience. And I remember starting our short dance thinking, I hope they don't regret their decision. And I spent the first minute worried about how they were watching the performance. <laughs> and they don't really know anything about skating. And the people that were in the crowd didn't know what they were watching. And... So I was just so outside of my head. And of course, then we were trying to prove that we were still kind of good, that we skated out of our skins. Like we just, we couldn't keep the energy in or between us or, you know, grounded whatsoever. Mm. So it was, but you're right. I guess there was, there was preparation and experience to draw on from after the the surgeries. Mm -hmm. Because the more success we had in our career, the more I felt every time we took the ice that people expected something yeah. and wanted to see a certain version of us. <laughs> I mean, that was troubling. I remember after our short dance, uh, the first outing back, we grabbed our sports psychologist, pulled him into a dressing room, and kept him there for two or three hours. And we didn't leave. We didn't take our skates off. We didn't leave. We just talked about how we just needed to handle it better. <laughs> oh, right after the... Like right what? after the short dance. So what was the biggest takeaway from those three hours of conversation? We needed to be okay with imperfection, and we needed to trust the process. Oh. We knew what we had signed up for, and we weren't trying to win the Olympics in August or September. <laughs> and somehow that got lost a little bit. Mm-hmm. And coming back to our why, you know, was it important that the crowd – at that particular venue, the few hundred people that were there, how they viewed us, was that really going to define us? And was that what we were seeking, that external validation? No. So we needed to come back to the why and what our purpose was for that entire comeback, and that was personal growth and excellence. Mm. And I know that as well as pursuing this, this deeper why that you identified, you rediscovered your passion for the sport. How did this feeling that you that you uncovered differ from what you thought was passion for the 18 years before? The passion previously had been tempered a little with injury and also I think just a toxic environment of knowing that I wanted to compete but it was a means to an end. Mm-hmm. It never felt like day to day that I was living out um, 
a joy or a passion. It felt truly like a job. And no one recognized me when I called home and said, I love skating every single day after (laughs) moving to Montreal. I would look at Scott and he would say, I don't know who you are right now. And I was just hanging off of every word the coaches said Mm -hmm. and I was excited I would pop out of bed in the morning and be excited to go into the rink Mm -hmm. and even double run-throughs I was sort of like bring it on which you know usually are riddled with such anxiety yeah Um, so it was so different I think a lot of that was the environment created by Marie France and Patrice um feeling like we were learning something new we tried to change our technique you know the the goal was to implement a 20 percent change uh, in our skating technique. I'm, I'm not sure if we succeeded with that, but to do that required 100% effort on every single session um, as we changed our mechanics. Mm-hmm. And so it just felt, I felt reinvigorated. I felt like this renewed sense of, wow, this, like, what can we do when, what can't we do actually when we love what we do? And um, everything, maybe it was being in Montreal, it was that point in our careers, but I think probably the most important element was that we were we were steering the ship. We were in control, and we were ready to do things in our own way, on our own terms. And if we learned nothing else from stepping away from the sport, it was just that, geez, if you don't love the process, it's not worth it. And so many skaters I just wanted to shake <laughs> along, along the way as I would see them get, you know, so dramatic and tormented and tortured over training sessions and of course when you care about something you know emotions run high yeah but having lived that olympic moment and understanding how fleeting that is i mean that would never be enough that's never enough to justify a really unenjoyable process and lead up you know a journey wise so we knew that the joy actually was in the hard work. We knew that mm. the satisfaction came from the day-to-day structured training. And just being able to be present and appreciate every single moment of that, it changed everything for us. It's just invaluable to hear you say this because not many people can be Olympic champions and have that feeling and then go on to say it's not all about that. And to have that element of comparison it's usually something that people yearn for but and expect so much from but you have that outlook and it's I just feel so grateful to be able to hear this and to share it with everyone listening as well so thank you for for that and it's amazing the control that you took in this comeback and it started from that conversation in the car where you envisioned your dream world who would be your coaches what would your skating style be as you said and of course, you moved to Montreal to train under Mary France Dubray, Patrice Nazan, and Roman Hagenauer. And given your history training alongside your biggest rivals in the past, Marilyn and Charlie, was training alongside your closest competitors an integral component in your dream world? Yeah, I think we learned and felt like it could only serve us um, and allow us to get better when we saw the best in the world every single day. Yeah. And I think with time, we learned to compartmentalize a little bit. So take the positives of how it could energize us, inspire us, um, what we could learn from our competitors, and then sometimes close it off, turn off the noise, just be in our own bubble and focused on what we needed. And mm-hmm. to do that, we needed our own team. So yes, we shared coaches, but we needed our own team of people off the ice that was different from our competitors feeling like we had a bit of an ace with our support staff um and something that was just ours yeah but yeah that was important for us and it's all we knew I mean we always just wanted to surround ourselves with the best and it felt like a competition every single day we went in so I think that served us as well because when we got to competition I mean, we were so used to those nerves. We were so used to what that dynamic felt like um, because we had practiced it. So for everyone listening that doesn't know, their Tessa and Scott's closest rivals leading into Pyeongchang were Francis, Gabriela Papadakis, and Guillaume Cizeron. So, of course, they were your training mates. So how did they influence you 
as competitors and training mates during your comeback? Learning about their training style was so fascinating when we first moved to Montreal because we approached things so differently. Um, they're quite laid back. I'm not sure how they are now, so I won't speak to that. But at that time, we were so structured about when we showed up to the rink. It was almost to the minute, the same time every day. And we had, you know, our warm-up routines and we would get on the ice and we just, we were filled with such purpose. And Gabby and Guillaume just had a different way of going about it. Um, they managed to accomplish all of that same work. They work incredibly hard and are very disciplined, but their attitude and how they approach it was really refreshing. So we learned a lot from that and we were able to take some of that um, ease maybe and apply it to our, our own skating. And of course we were just in awe anytime we got to watch them perform because they would almost go into a trance, like another world where their bodies are so fluidly moving as one and the knee bend is unparalleled and the glide of the the blade and the power I mean so much of that we could get lost in and enjoy and appreciate and we just had such admiration for who mm -hmm. they were as athletes and ultimately I think given what we had learned from Marilyn Charlie we learned that we didn't have to try and beat them by making their strengths our strengths, we needed to have our own. And that was then up to the judges to compare and decide. But we weren't going to beat Gabby and Guillaume by trying to be Gabby and Guillaume um, because no one could be. And I think there was also just an empowered feeling with making that decision of, you know, we'll approach it in our own way and in our own style. Yeah. And it's the same, like even outside of skating, no, you can't be anyone else. So stop trying to be anyone else. You can only be the best Tessa Virtue, Lila Fear, whoever mm -hmm. it is. Um, and it's something that skating allows us to realize, but it's something that can be applied in any area of, of our lives. You're listening to the Lila Joe show. So I know this hasn't been released to Instagram yet, but I'm far too curious to wait. So we're in Pyeongchang now, it's six days before the competition, you're curling up in a corner to write in your journal. What are you writing down? I'm writing down, actually I can remember about that timeline because we were probably in Seoul after having competed in the team event, we went to Seoul for two days. Um, tried to recover, basically just stayed in bed and ordered room service, and it was lovely. <laughs> Love it. Just got out of the Olympic bubble, and thinking, you know, in a few days' time, we'd be gearing up for the main um, individual competition. And I remember just feeling like we were living out what we had talked about. You know that Adele song where she says, um, Oh, what are the, what's the lyric? Something about having a conversation in her head a thousand times so she feels she, she, she's lived it. Yes. Um, oh, I don't remember the that. Sorry, I just butchered that. But anyways, I felt like we were just living out exactly what we had planned and scheduled and prepared for for two years. And every single day we simulated that. Mm -hmm. So there weren't really many surprises um, because we had prepared for any and every circumstance. And... I remember thinking we had, you know, a serious task ahead of us because we knew Gabby and Guillaume would be at their best. Um, we learned a lot from competing in the team event, so we were applying some changes to maximize points. Oh. But I felt ready and I felt as if the work had been done because we didn't leave any stone unturned in mm. those two years. And honestly, that is the best feeling as an athlete because there's such strength in in preparation and feeling confident about that. And I had faith in our team. I had faith in our plan. I loved our material. I was excited to skate across the Olympic ranks. Oh. And I wanted to enjoy every practice, every warm up, every cool down. I, I loved being an athlete at the Olympics. And I realized that I was living out what I would later reflect on as probably my favorite time. Oh my gosh. I bet that's just all you can ever ask for, especially after Sochi where you did feel like there were some stones that were left unturned. So 
as you said, you your mantra was, we are unstoppable. So how does feeling unstoppable reflect in the level of nerves that you feel when taking your starting pose for Moulin Rouge and hearing those first few notes resound throughout the electric arena? The lead up was the hardest part. We had a practice two days before where we did almost a full run through of our, of our free dance. I think the judges were there. We were in the practice facility and I whispered to Scott afterwards, like, that's how you win the Olympics. Because it felt like we were just building back up again. And I don't mean that to sound arrogant because no, not at all. I was still, ta- I was still so scared. So, so scared. But there was a moment backstage. We, we had 45 minutes or 40 minutes um, between the warm up and oh, our skate. That's the worst. <laughs> Which is the worst. Oh. And we took our skates off and I, have never been so nervous in my life. Um, my, I felt it physically, emotionally, mentally. I could hardly stop shaking. And we were pacing back and forth. And I, I knew Scott was nervous too. But he just kept saying to me, this is exactly what we wanted. This is the storyline we want. We want to skate last. We want Gabby and, to go, and Guillaume to set a world record. And we didn't know they actually had. Um, we want them to be at their best and we want basically the ball in our hands at the end of the game, you know, mm. with one second left. We want to be in control of that. And he was so right. And I found a lot of comfort in that because I thought, yeah, this is what I, you know, this is what we've been working towards. This is the moment. And Marie France always said to us, when the music starts, you know what to do. Mm. So we just knew that we needed to control ourselves enough to get to the starting position. And for us, that was just seeking comfort in one another and... Okay and our team and again we had practice like our coaches knew exactly what to say to us in those moments and our mental prep coach who was there because we had rehearsed it and so it wasn't foreign territory for anyone although it was maybe just the magnitude of it all seemed greater um but we knew exactly what we needed to do when we stepped on the ice was silver ever even an option in your mind i mean 20th was an option in my mind <laughs> at some point. I think I was prepared for anything in the whole comeback. And okay. I was, <laughs> we had extensive and lengthy conversations with Marie and Patch as we decided to come back where they said, you know, what if you go to the Olympics in your 10th? And we said, you know, that's a risk you take. It's sport. And we also had that debate about what's more important, creating art or winning. Hmm. And we always thought we could do both. Um, I think instinctively I would have said winning, but then upon reflection realized, no, it was actually about the moment. It really was. So second for sure was an option. And I think that that there was a very good chance that that could have happened. It could have gone that way, but we just put ourselves in, in the position to be the best we possibly could in that, in that moment. Even if we weren't at our best, we needed to be, the best or good enough. Mm -hmm. This two-year comeback was meticulously planned with the final image in mind, you standing atop the podium in Pyeongchang. But the thing is, life continues when you step down off the podium and board the plane back home. So how much thought was given to life after the two-year plan? And how did you keep your blinders up to the what's next while remaining so focused on the task at hand? We were very cognizant about that transition after skating. And almost every session we did with our sports psychologist, we touched upon that very subject of how life looks and how we shape that after skating. So I never wanted to define myself or identify myself solely as a skater. I knew that that would be a platform from which I would jump off after. And I felt it allowed us the freedom to be really present in sport. I know there's this mentality of if you have a plan B or a C or a D, that maybe you're not putting all your eggs into one basket Mm -hmm. and only relying on plan A. Yeah. But I felt it just further solidified the fact that skating is finite. That time as an athlete in our lives was significant, but it was over like that. Oh my gosh. And I'm knowing what my rough plan was after the games 
which was also fairly planned out, was important to my success as an athlete because I needed to know that, um, you know, my future didn't entirely depend on the moment of the Olympics, you know, life okay. would go on yeah. and there was more than just figure skating in life. There was a big world out there I could explore and somehow that made me feel better um, and, and it alleviated some pressure. How much did the next steps after the games ride upon the gold medal around your neck? That's a great question. I think it was probably different in Pyeongchang. I'm not sure if that was the effect of social media, the coverage, oh, yeah. um, maybe just that it was our third Olympic Games. I'm not sure, but it was different. It really was different. But I felt like my personal priorities didn't really change. Uh, I was so sick for months after the games. I, I got bronchitis in the flu as soon as we finished competing, but then it lasted <laughs> for months. Oh my gosh. So I was also forced to sort of shut down a little bit, and then I stayed busy as I was really sick, so there wasn't really time to think. But I was able to dive into that world and chaos knowing I had expected it. Okay. I had sort of anticipated that whirlwind, and it's a short window for Olympians and athletes following the games. It's a really short, short window. Um, so I was ready to say yes to some things and experience things. Um, and it changed just, I think, because there was a different sense of notoriety or a different level of that maybe when we came home, which mm -hmm. again is fleeting too. But. Yeah. And in those years leading up to Pyeongchang, not a decision was made where you didn't ask your question of will this help me win the Olympics what is the question that you ask yourself now to replace this hmm will this allow me to learn mm. so that I can grow into the business from when I hope to be oh how long did it take you to identify that question not long not okay. long because like you I'm very curious and ever since I was really exposed to I would say the business world or the corporate world I was fascinated by it and I always wanted to understand how it works and I I assumed that at some point in my life that would be a role that I would take on something in business and I started having these informational interviews I realized they're called I didn't know I was doing them but I would just meet with people and mentors and amass this really great network of people who could help me learn and I could learn vicariously through their experiences and their insight and glean some wisdom um, from you know someone else and I think there's something to learn from everyone yeah so that question was ever present but it came to the forefront when the Olympics was off the table and that became a driving force and you know I'm stepping into a world now almost everything I do I I don't have the credibility of the experience that I did in ice dance and so my whole goal is just to learn and grow and evolve and challenge myself personally in new ways mm. following the retirement you said it'll be interesting to see how I fill that void and this is something that really looms ahead for every athlete to what extent have you sought to draw parallels between your skating and your life in this new chapter in order to simulate the aspects of the sport that gave you such purpose and growth? In the same way you've structured your interviews to mimic workouts, I think the same can be said for how I'm approaching new challenges now. So that's learning everything I possibly can about whatever the field or, you know, um, thing I'm taking on, putting the right team of people around me to rely on those resources and to feel supported, being very clear about an action plan and my priorities, um, being conscious of how I manage my energy. Right. Uh, you know, all of that, it, what we learn as athletes really is applicable and I think what I was searching for for such a long time was one overriding goal that felt meaningful and significant like the Olympics did mm -hmm. for me. But I realize now 
it's I can't define that until I learn about um, what the various paths and options look and feel and sound like. Mm. So you're really an avid student. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And upon retiring, you said, it's a little daunting in some ways because whatever I take on next, I won't be the best in the world at. I was in a niche, specialized job, but I do think the skills are so transferable. And I agree with you, the skills are transferable, but along with the skills accompanies the human who is exercising them. So Tessa, what is your niche as a human? Hmm. I think my niche as a human is connecting with people and being able to connect on a level that feels deep and meaningful. And part of that is, as you mentioned at the beginning, I guess just that empathy, Mm -hmm. um, genuine curiosity, but empathy for, you know, where other people are coming from, what they've experienced. You said that you are a perfectionist, as am I, and um, when asked about your weakness as a skater, you replied, oh geez, I mean, how long do we have here? (laughs) And while this may be advantageous to set yourself such a high bar as an athlete, off of the ice, I know that it can be detrimental in terms of self-acceptance. So how have you learned to remove the critic's lens of judgment that we have been trained to have as athletes and embrace who you are as you are today? Hmm. Beautifully worded question. I'm learning still to differentiate the elements of perfectionism and what parts of it fuel me in my pursuit of success and what parts chip away at my sense of self-worth. So I think being aware, first of all, is paramount trying to give myself a bit of freedom and flexibility, being a little bit kinder and gentler, Mm -hmm. uh, just in my self analysis and realizing that, that I'm okay, you know, I'm learning and I'm, I'm trying to grow and be better always, but that if I do my best in any given moment, then that's enough. You know, I just I just have to know that that's enough and it mm-hmm. won't always be perfect and it won't always please everyone. Yes. But ultimately what, what I come back to is just acting in accordance to my own values. So being really clear about what I value as a person and allowing that to drive me and drive decisions. And when you can always stand behind that yeah. then it is really a comforting thing mm. and it, it takes reflecting and knowing those values too and affirming that they're chosen and they're yours in each moment and encounter you are such a genuine and honest person and it's something that I admire so much about you and of course as such a high profile person in the public eye you have to keep a guard up in some way how do you demonstrate your authenticity while protecting yourself and your heart thank you for the compliments and I mean they go right back your way I'm in awe of how eloquent and thoughtful and and generous of heart you are thank you Uh, I think as far as balancing the personal and public elements of my life sort of back to the values if if I feel like I can be myself in any situation and sure you know corporate test of virtue might be slightly different than the test of virtue at home on those date nights Mm -hmm. but it's the same me because it's it's exactly how I feel and who I want to be and who I am then it's easier I don't feel like there's a mask I'm putting on and and taking off Mm. and and coming to terms with that was really important and feeling like I can give my whole to something and I can give my all to something and still leave some for me and those closest to me. You know, there's a little fence around part of me that will never be accessible to, you know, the public en masse. And I don't think they should ever even want that. But I will give every single morsel of... (laughs) the rest of my being um, to whatever it is I take on. 
And how do you decide where to put up the fence? So much for me is just protecting the people in my life. So I, I, I'm pretty comfortable being an open book and I'm, I feel almost like I chose this life of being in the public eye and I, I knew what it would entail to some extent, but the people around me didn't necessarily. And I'm, I'm very protective and conscious of that. Okay. Um, so a lot of that is just, you know, close family and friends. Yeah. And you said that one of your greatest skills is empowering those around you and you're currently taking a stand to shift the narrative of self-esteem in young girls. Can you share a story or experience when you struggled the most with self-esteem and how did you build up to the self-assurance that you demonstrate so effortlessly today? I struggled most with self-esteem probably the early years of living in Michigan uh, training, so 15, 16, 17 I think that's a tough age for many females, oh, you know, yeah. as you're coming into your own and navigating the world. Um, but I, I had to learn to lean on the people around me that I really trusted. And unfortunately, some of those people broke that trust and, you know, that loss of innocence in that sense. And everyone experiences that in their own way. Yeah. And I can look back on that and reflect on the fact that it, allowed me to grow and really be discerning about um, who I surrounded myself with, but also learning to accept every part of my being. And whether that was on the ice, even when I put myself out there to be criticized um, or off the ice, I think I had to learn to filter what voices I let in. And mm. everyone has an opinion. Everyone wants a piece of you and a piece of your success. But if you can filter, filter those voices and, and narrow it down to people who really have your best interest at heart, then it's constructive. And it's, you know, it just, it builds you up in a way uh, instead of tearing you down. Yeah. It's hard to discern it though, right? Without going through those harder experiences where the trust is broken exactly I, I mean you you do need to go through that and you yeah. need to learn those things in life and it's never going to be perfect even as we get older it, it's almost a coming of age you yeah. know I think it's um it's just an inevitable part of everyone's journey and, and growth and one major aspect of our sport is the immense amount of pressure on the female to look a certain way and you said that you've dealt with a lot of negative opinions and feedback and narratives surrounding the way that you look on the ice and how you should look. And your response was to adopt the personal mission to be healthier and stronger and to prove to young girls that you can stand atop of the podium and fuel your body and that you don't need to deprive it of nutrients. And as a self-proclaimed perfectionist and people pleaser, it's surprising to me that this was your response rather than conforming to the expectations and standards of others. So where did this variance in your behavioral pattern come from and why did it arise in this specific area of your life? It's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. I think... I think I was able to understand that my body was the vehicle with which I would be able to achieve success. And if I didn't take care of it, um, it wouldn't serve me and it wouldn't help anyone, you know, that, that Scott would be affected too. Yeah. And I felt pressure, of course, and I felt judged and criticized and like I wasn't enough. But I tried to channel that doubt into how I could hone a skill set that would allow my skating to speak for itself. Uh, however my body looked doing it, I wanted to be good enough so that maybe the conversation shifted. And mm -hmm. so that was just my personal approach in, in wanting to apply it to the sport, um, both technically and artistically, through movement. And also, I had an ally in Scott. We talked a lot about this notion of portraying a man and a woman on the ice. And to do that, I needed to look like a woman, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it and <laughs> I think as long as I was fit and healthy and strong and I could, you know, push through the programs, 
that was my barometer. I was never really much, um, you know, for scales or things like that. It wasn't, it wasn't that it was, I had to really think about from a sensory perspective, how I felt skating. So how do you suggest people who don't have skating as the, the avenue to kind of channel your body as a vehicle, how do they reframe thoughts of doubt and inadequacy when there isn't this specific goal in mind? For me, I find taking stock of how I feel head to toe really helps. And also just, (laughs) I still do this every day. I think this is the body I'm working with today. Mm. This is what I have. So I'm going to be kind to it. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to be gentle because it's all I've got. Mm. And if I berate it and am I negative in my thoughts and if I look at my own body that way, then how can I expect it to carry me through, whether that's athletically or not? Yeah. How can I expect it to, to be the vehicle with which I work through life? And and that's just my own sort of visual for it. It's, it's um, I would rather embrace the things that make it imperfect than, than just get lost in trying to change the things I can't change. I mean, I'm always going to be muscular. I'm always going to have thicker thighs or broad shoulders. And, you know, I've, I've spent enough time over the years thinking about how I could change that. And if, you know, I wish I could change that, but I think ultimately when I'm 90 looking back on my life, I'm going to, I'm going to think that was a waste of time. Yeah, that is <laughs> you know, such a good point. <laughs> it's such a good point. And it, it involves surrendering to what you have and just owning it. Exactly. And celebrating. Yeah, and the way that you would speak to yourself, I like thinking about, would I speak to a friend like that? Yeah. And so often, you know, we're just so hard on ourselves unnecessarily. So when we should be our own biggest ally and you know little cheerleader (laughs) yeah so along with this positive mindset and and perspective with your body I think it's so important to have a positive vision for the future as well so I have a little way that I like to end the the workout section of my interview where I'm going to ask you to envision your dream life five years from now where are you what are you doing and who are you with hmm So I recently did a job interview that asked me this question and my first response I think surprised them because I said I pictured myself in a great power suit, you know, (laughs) sober in the corporate sphere and they were really perplexed. It was a room of men, so they were really perplexed by the power suit visual and I said, well, to me, that means that I'm empowered, that I, you know, it's something for me to work towards that is an image um, of, of something to evolve and grow characteristically in order to fit that almost so five years from now I I think I hope to have a better understanding I'll have gone through school um, Mm. and I I hope to be in a role in a work position that allows me to learn and grow and be exposed to to a lot of different kind of departments That's, Mm. that's sort of where I'm aiming right now just simply so that I have experience yeah well, I have a certain skill set. I don't have any workplace experience. <laughs> um, I hope that I'm surrounded by quality people that inspire me the way that I am right now. I don't exactly know where I'll be, but I kind of like that. Yeah. I, I sort of like that I'm not um, limited. Yes. You're limitless as your mother taught you from a young age. <laughs> so now our, our workout's done. It's time to cool down quickly. Okay. As you mentioned, you did a lot of marriage counseling with Scott throughout your career. So does this mean that you're now an expert at dating? And if so, do give me some tips. (laughs) I think you're just fine, Lila. Oh, thank Um, you. (laughs) I I would never claim to be an expert by any means, but I do think that it, it made me approach a relationship differently in that I was very conscious of the patterns that we created early on Mm. and I really was aware of setting a really solid and strong foundation so I think some of that applies and simply just having 
dedicated 22 years to nurturing a certain partnership, I understand the value of that and the work that goes into it. So I think going in with eyes wide open is, is healthy. Yeah. If you could write a letter of thanks to one person who might not necessarily be expecting it, who would you write it to and what would you say? It's a really good question. Someone who wouldn't expect it. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, I love writing letters. I love writing cards. So I often do that to the, for the people in my life. But when you asked the question, something struck me. And that was maybe a letter of thanks would go to the people along the way who, who did doubt me or us, Scott and I on the ice. Because that in itself provided a really good lesson and a really good time to evaluate, restructure, to find my own purpose and my own why. And sometimes we're so quick to dismiss, you know, those negative elements or those obstacles, those hurdles, but they are really the things that shape you. So maybe I would try and embrace that and it might be unexpected, but send a letter of thanks to all of those along the way who weren't on the bandwagon. (laughs) Yeah, and I suppose it would be surprising for them because often the intention is to hinder you and to bring you down um, in those circumstances. I mean, in the context of skating, we had the privilege of working with Charlie White this last year. Um, He choreographed and directed our tour creatively. And, you know, writing a letter to him at the end of that was a letter that I never imagined you know, after 10 years of a heated rivalry, being able to share feelings and thoughts and experiences and really come together and create something special was so, so special and getting time with he and Tanith. um, I loved that and it was unexpected, but I so value the way he views the world and especially skating. Mm. With whom do you feel most authentically, Tessa? My mom. And Morgan. And Morgan. What is your favorite quote right now? I love Mm. quotes. This is an old one that I've just come back to because I found a fan who made a, uh, I found a makeup case made by a fan that has this quote on it. And um, it says, don't be delicate, be vast and brilliant. And it's one that I've held on to for a long time. I love that. And final question. What is your number one book recommendation? Of all time, The Gentleman in Moscow. I've never read it. You haven't? I know what I'm going to read today. Oh, I'm legitimately jealous that you have that to look forward to. Okay. Oh, I'm so excited. So You'll love it. This recommendation will be put to good use because I have a tradition on my show where I give my guest the book that was recommended by my previous guest. Oh, and, and I know so that you who was your guest it. and what did they recommend? So my guest was Adam Robinson, and he recommended Zen in the Art of Archery by Professor Eugen Harrigal, and I wrote out a little synopsis. So this book is the result of the author's six-year quest to learn archery in the hands of Japanese Zen masters. It is an honest account of one man's journey to complete abandonment of the self and the Western principles that we use to define ourselves. I've heard of this book, but I've not read it, so I'm so excited. I actually have it here, and I haven't read it either, so I'll really quickly read A Gentleman in Moscow, and then we can read it together, okay? Yeah, okay, that sounds great. And Tessa, this was such a joy speaking with you today, and I just thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and for your wonderful friendship and just who you are. I so appreciate it, and what thoughtful questions and conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a joy. Thanks, Tessa. I'm Lila, and you've been listening to The Lila Joe Show. You can follow the show on Instagram and Twitter. If you haven't yet, head over to Apple Podcast and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next time for another episode. Thanks for listening.